body of teenage kidnapped victim Leslie Whittle has been found in a shaft at Bathpool Park, Staffordshire, after a seven-week search. The 17-year-old heiress had not been seen since she was abducted from a home in Highley, Shropshire, on January the 14th. How evil, how ruthless, how terribly wicked this man is that we've hunted for seven weeks. God above, I never dreamt in my wildest dreams he'd do such a thing to a girl. It's, it, it's, it's terrible. All the evidence suggested that the Black Panther had killed Leslie on the night of the failed ransom run to Bathpool Park. But if so, why had he murdered her instead of collecting the ransom money and making his getaway? One possible explanation was about to emerge. Nightclub DJ Peter Shorto had been in the park with his girlfriend at exactly the time Ronald Whittle was due to hand over the £50,000. Yes, I left work uh, about half past two in the morning. Arrived here about um, quarter to three uh, with my girlfriend. I um, was here for about 15 minutes. Um, I saw a torch in front of me about 150 yards, um, either flashing on and off or uh, waving from side to side. I just assumed it was somebody out for a late night uh, walk or walking his, his dog, perhaps, you know, I thought nothing about it at all. It seemed that the panther had mistaken Shorto for Ronald Whittle and was signalling him to bring the ransom money. But his evidence contained an even more controversial claim. But at the same time, a police panda car um, drove in. They stopped just to my right, about 100 yards away. They stopped for a cigarette. If Shorter was right, a police car had stumbled into the ransom operation as the panther was planning to collect the money. Booth believed this was a potentially fatal blunder. Immediately, I recognised that what had happened was that the kidnapper had panicked because of that police car. I had no doubts whatsoever in my mind that that's what had compromised the operation. He murdered her because of that police panda car causing him to panic and he vented his anger on her by pushing her to a death down that shaft, that hellhole of a place of confinement. Booth's interpretation is disputed by Harold Wright, the head of Staffordshire CID at the time. He believes Shorto was mistaken. We've got to accept there were a courting couple in Bathpool that night. We've got to accept they saw a police vehicle or something that to them resembled a police vehicle. They did not see a Staffordshire police vehicle because there was no Staffordshire officer or vehicle near Bathpool that night. There's no doubt at all it was, um, it was a panda car. Definitely. You couldn't have mistaken it for any other car? No, it was a panda car. The war of words over the panda car caused a bitter rift between senior police officers, but the only man who knew the truth was the Black Panther himself, and he was still at large. As panic began to sweep the country, Staffordshire police announced they were calling in Scotland Yard to lead the murder hunt. Bob Booth was to be sidelined. Commander John Morrison, head of the Yard's International Murder Squad, was to lead the investigation, with Inspector Wally Borham in charge of the incident room. Most um, murder inquiries, when you arrive at the scene, you've got a dearth of clues, and uh, by investigation, you build up those clues systematically. In this case, it was almost uh, unique. We were inundated with clues. There was a mattress. Uh, there were Zeiss binoculars that were found in the park. There was a tape found in the park. There's Dymo tape found in the park. There's a tape recorder found down the shaft. And it just went on and on and on. So we were absolutely inundated. We had an embarrassment of riches for clues. Detectives began work tracing where the abandoned items had been bought, confident that the paper trail would lead them to the kidnapper. 
To keep the pressure on, they released the kidnappers' handwriting in case anyone recognized it and demonstrated the kind of wire used as a noose for Leslie. The biggest clue of all was a fingerprint found on a notepad left in the death shaft. But when no match was found in millions of police files, even this failed to unmask the Black Panther. We knew everything about the man we wanted. We got his height, his age, his clothing, everything about him. We knew everything about him except his name and address. For several months, Britain's biggest ever manhunt dragged on with no sign of a breakthrough. Then, almost a year after Leslie Whittle's kidnap, there was a sensational new development. Two policemen had just started panda car duty in Mansfield when they went to question a man acting suspiciously near a post office. Whilst my colleague was asking the questions, I was writing the answers down. And as I got to the more or less the last question, suddenly a voice says, don't move, any tricks and you're dead. At this point I glanced to my left and was looking down the business end of a double barrel sawn off shotgun. And the exact words at that time was, fucking hell, and that's all I said. And the next thing I felt was this gun pushed into my ribs underneath my armpit. And on getting himself comfortable, he says, right, drive. Well, I, I thought that we'd got this local nutter to be quite precise with you. I was thinking now we've got to do something here uh, to get help or disarming or something. As we're going down the hill, the road goes into a Y-shaped junction. I'm thinking, whichever way we go, we're going into open country. And if we get into open country, there's no way that we are going to survive this. I believe he was, was going to kill us. And I swung the car across the road to the right, over the white line, and then swung it back to the left, braked hard. The car came to a halt outside a chip shop where Roy Morris was ordering his supper. When he saw two police officers fighting a gunman, he came running to help. I said to him, well, what do you want me to do? What's going off, you know? And he says, grab his wrist. Because yeah. we got him on the floor and we yeah. were struggling yeah. like mad yeah. to, get, to get hold of him yeah, because we right. were overpowering him. Yeah. I was looking in his eyes and he, he, his eyes didn't look at me. They were partially closed and sort of... Shaking as if you like, as if you as if you were mad because he couldn't do nothing. And I said to you, get his wrist together so yes. we can get the handcuffs yes. on. So I grabbed his wrist and they, they, I held him there till they got the cuffs on. They were all over in a minute, yeah. weren't they? I mean, it, it sent to lifetime really, yeah. but by yeah. the time yeah. it was all over, it was it, over in seconds. The time we picked him up from here and going to them railings and cuffed him again and then searched him. That were a longer spell of time than what happened here. At the end of the day, we ended up protecting him. Well, there were quite him. a crowd gathered, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I can remember one bloke took a... threw a blow at him. Battered and bruised, the gunman was taken away for questioning. For two days, he remained silent. Then he reluctantly gave his name. He was Donald Nielsen, a self-employed joiner from Bradford. A former soldier... Nielsen had seen action in Cyprus and Aden and had learned jungle warfare in Kenya. He was married and had a daughter almost exactly the same age as Leslie Whittle. Police began a detailed search of his home and in a locked attic, 
they found an extraordinary collection of equipment. Tools, maps, car keys, and black hoods. They found weapons, including a sawn-off shotgun and ammunition. And in the back of a drawer, they found this model of a Black Panther. If Donald Nielsen was Britain's most wanted man, it seemed he had secretly enjoyed the notoriety. Suspected of being the notorious Black Panther, Donald Nielsen was taken to Staffordshire to be questioned about the kidnap of Leslie Whittle and numerous other violent crimes. He began a series of bizarre interviews. He would be asked a question, a simplest of questions, um, and he would look at the wall and merely count the bricks in the wall for maybe 20, 25 minutes. We, uh, and, and he, just as you thought that he was not going to answer this question, he'd blurt out an answer. And not necessarily to the question you'd asked, but certainly he made some sort of comment. And then you'd follow that up with another question, and the same thing would happen. And slowly but surely, um, as we put more and more points to him, uh, showing him uh, the evidence that, that we had, he changed tack. And he wanted to tell us all about all of the murders. And suddenly he said, in fact, what I'll do to help you, I'll make a separate statement for each murder. There was a heavy police guard to hold back the crowds outside the court. Some of them had been waiting for five to six hours. By the time the accused arrived in a convoy of cars hidden under a blanket, there were about 200 onlookers booing and jeering. Nielsen was charged with 13 violent crimes, including four murders. When he appeared in court, the journalists who had pursued him for a year were desperate to get their first glimpse of him. The picture I had in my mind was a kind of territorial army type, you know, tall, muscular, fitness fanatic. Um, and there was this really awful little man who was about five foot six and just really ordinary looking. You would have passed him in the street a million times and never stopped and thought, I wonder if that's the Black Panther. But the truth behind Leslie Whittle's death still proved elusive. Nielsen admitted he'd suspected a police trap, but claimed it was the sound of helicopters and dogs which had panicked him, and not a police car. As he'd rushed to the shaft to gather his belongings, he'd accidentally knocked Leslie off the platform to her death. There was certainly no evidence of a helicopter, no evidence of dogs. One can only think that he thought that he'd heard dogs, he thought that he'd heard a helicopter, he thought a trap was closing in on him, and he panicked. For maybe not the first time in his criminal escapades, he panicked. And a young lady um, paid for it with her life because things didn't go right that night, somebody had to pay. Well, there was only one person that could pay, and that was Leslie Whittle, in his eyes. Booth wasn't convinced. He still believed that a panda car had caused Leslie's death. And after Nielsen had finished his confessions, Booth finally confronted the man he'd hunted for a year. My first impression was the, the lasting one. He was coiled up to react in a second, and that sums Nielsen up. Booth secretly tape-recorded his interviews with Nielsen. None have ever been heard in public until now. I mean, Well, I know for a fact that I'm right. 
Booth interpreted this to mean that Nielsen blamed him for sending the panda car into Bathpool Park. <laughs> 